I don't know about you, but on some occasions, I feel I have to justify myself for being a Christian. For me, it usually happens when I meet someone I haven't met in many years. I would ask my old friend, how are you, what are you doing, are you married, kids? You know, the usual question, nothing crazy. And then my friend would ask me the same questions. And when I say that I'm an ordained minister in the United Church of Canada, there is almost always this awkward and very long moment of silence. I can see in my friend's eyes that he or she has no clue what to say or, or how to be, they, they, they're completely gone. So I rapidly say that I'm not like those crazy ones he or she might have met or seen on TV. I'm not like this women in Kentucky who denied a marriage license to a gay couple because she believed her understanding of the Bible uh, is more important than the constitution of her country. I'm not like Viktor Orban, the Prime Minister of Hungary, who said that the current migrant crisis is a serious threat to the European Christian identity. I'm not like those extremists found in all religious groups who denied women the same rights and the same privilege that men have. I'm Christian, but I'm not like them. Defining my identity by the negative might be very Canadian, because you know what is a Canadian? It's someone who is not like an American. We often hear those things. Like I said, it's, it might be very Canadian, but it's a bit annoying. I wish we Christian could be known according to, not, not, not according to the perception or the expectation of others, but according to what we actually do and say. I wish people could stop saying that church people should do this or they ought to behave that way and come and see inside our churches, see for themselves what we are truly doing and saying these days. I wish we could not be put in predetermined categories or constantly compared to others. I wish we could be known for who we are. And I'm not the first one who wish something like this. When we are reading this morning passage from the Gospel according to Mark, we find the same issue. One day Jesus travels north from the Sea of Galilee with his disciple to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. And this detail might seem trivial, but it's not. Because this area is not a Jewish territory in Jesus' time. It was a place different, with a different culture, different reference, different lifestyle. And experience taught us that when we are in those different places, those foreign places, we tend to develop a better and clearer understanding of ourselves because we are forced to do so. We cannot take for granted that people know and understand exactly who we are. For example, I do not think I have to tell you what church people usually do on a Sunday morning because it would be very sad <laughs> and I would not be a very good minister. No, you probably know, but maybe it's, a less, it's less obvious for those who are living in Afghanistan, Bhutan, Cambodia, because in those foreign places there's not that many Christians and one Christian could have to explain 
what Sunday morning is all about. One, I have to put words on what is obvious and did not need a definition previously. One should have to answer question never asked before because they were unnecessarily, because everybody assumed to know the answer. So on the way, Jesus has a pop quiz for his disciples. He said something like, well, since Survey Monkey or Angus Street did not exist yet, yet to conduct a survey for us, tell me, my friend, who do people say that I am? Well, according to disciple, the buzz in the street was there was various opinion and answers to that question. So some called Jesus, Jesus a prophet, like John the Baptist or, or the great Elijah that would have come back to life. Some said he was a magical healer or a miracle worker. We know from other part of the Gospels that some call him a public nuisance, a charlatan, a, a blasphemer. And I'm convinced, I'm deeply convinced that some call him names that should not be repeated in a church or in good company. And then Jesus said, but who do you say that I am? Not the people out there. You. Uh, this one is a tough question. But it's very legitimate. After all that I've all the time they have been together. After all the impressive deeds that they witnesses, and after all the speech Jesus gave about the realm of God, one might expect that the disciple must have a good answer to who and their master is, what is his true identity. So Peter answered back, you're the Messiah. The Christ, the Anointed One, the One we have been waiting for, waiting for for so long. And immediately Jesus, and I quote, sternly order not to tell anyone about Him. Why? We're not quite sure. Probably back then people had various expectations of what the Messiah should do and, and who he should be. There were most likely as many definitions for the job than there were people around. But no matter what, was, what were the reason of Jesus, the disciple never received a clear and definite answer to that question. And still today, Christians are wrestling with Jesus' question. But who do you think I am? Well, more conservative voices tend to present a clear and compelling answer about Jesus' identity and their need first to accept Him as their Lord and Savior and second to convince others to do the same. More progressive voices seems to strive to explore who Jesus was historically and to focus on his action as much as his words in order to understand his true identity. But the problem with this question is, like I said earlier, Jesus never helped us to answer this question. Jesus never gave us a set of statements or doctrines to follow besides love one another as I love you. In fact, I'm convinced Jesus would flunk a systematic theology class that is taught these days in our theological college. It did not seem to be his thing. And Jesus never gave us a creed. Like the historical creed we sometimes recite in church that are containing sets of approved beliefs, admission, and explanations. In the Gospel, Jesus 
does not use the, the power name we gave him and, and we use regularly, like Savior, Redeemer, Incarnate Word, Kings of Kings, Lord of all who shall reign forever and ever. Jesus never told us what is the correct answer to who do you think I am? And this absence of a definitive answer leads many to dig even further into the Bible. They're trying to decipher coded words or hidden messages that could settle the case once for all. And because there must be an answer to this question. And when they think they have found one, whoa, they stick with it. Regardless if it makes sense or not, if it hurt others or violate the laws we gave ourselves. They believe they're right and the people who disagree with them are simply wrong. And once again, once again, Jesus did not tell his disciples to follow that path. It did not say, okay, this is what you should believe and it never can be changed, so learn it by heart and repeat it ad nauseam. No, no, no. Jesus asked the question, who do you think I am? And as strange as it, it feels for most of us, Jesus is actually waiting for our answer. Because, because Jesus believed that we could because Jesus believed that we are able to come with, formulate a good one, a good answer. Not because we have learned all the good theological and religious answers, but because we all have a relationship with him. We all can see how some stories of Jesus help us during a moment of our lives. We can all share why we did a little more than required, a little more than the minimum that, that time, because we were inspired by the life of Jesus. We can all recall all those times when we felt that he was present in our midst, sometimes just in front of us. We can all tell what emerged and grew inside ourselves because Jesus was part of our lives. We can give those answers because, like I said, we have a relationship with Jesus. And it's this relationship that tells more than all those beautiful and, and well-crafted answers. When I'm saying I'm Reverend Stéphane Vermette, or when we're saying we're Christian, or, or Jesus is the Messiah, we're saying statements that carry a great amount of baggage because people tend to put in them their own experience, their own expectation, their own judgment. And too many have been hurt because they were forced to believe in a certain way. Or some people have tried to force on others their beliefs and their understanding of who Jesus is. So our response to those situations could be different. Could be model on, the, model on Jesus. When someone comes to us and Ask us a challenging question, a difficult question. Or we can answer maybe with another question. What should a great Christian do? Well, how do you define what is a good Christian? Is Jesus the only and true Messiah? Well, what do you understand by Messiah? And this way is not meant to be annoying or avoid committing ourselves one way or another. It is just that it allows us 
to move from, from justification, from, from debate, from, from certainty, to a state of mind where we will not be afraid to have a conversation, to question, to explore, to challenge our faith and our spirituality, it can allow us to keep our conversation with our friends, family member, or with, with stranger we meet at the grocery store, we can keep those conversations open. It can help us to discover who each of us is and who we are called to be. It can even allow us to begin to put some words when we are asked by Jesus, who do you think I am? Amen.